God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's the first time we've had every member of the fivefold in this, in this, in this house. Praise God. Praise God. God is preparing to equip the ministers, the leaders, for the coming revival in our area. Um, and um, we pray you guys are blessed by all the messages every time they come out. Share them with friends. Uh, they're His words. We love you, Lord Jesus. We go to you in prayer. We thank you for the words. We thank you that you minister to us. You refresh our soul. You lead us by still waters. You set a table before us in the presence of our enemies and your our cup overflows just like you said and you promised that you came to give life and life more abundant. And you have done so. You have filled up our cups to overflowing a bubbling brook through us. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your very presence in us by your Holy Spirit. Open your... Uh, Lord Jesus, we are frail. Your words are true. You watch over your, worm to, your, excuse me, your word to perform it. And nothing, none of your word returns void. Lord, use us to deliver your words. Fill in the pieces. Lord, we, we do in obedience. And you can magnify and do far above, beyond all we can ask or think or dream or imagine. Open your word now to our hearts. Jesus, uh, open the eyes of our hearts that it may have understanding. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, this is... Uh, uh, Lyra, do you want to start? Do you want me to start? Okay, go to Psalm 27, uh, verse 1. Um, I've personally found it, and I give personal testimony. It, it is so easy. Guys, I'm going to tell you the, the warning. Don't think in your head, and, and I speak to myself, if somebody's going to give you a Bible reference, uh, a passage to read, Please, I beg you, uh, please learn. Uh, uh, you know, take, take the example. If they give you a reference, don't think in your head. And the problem is we don't even say it out loud. Oh, I know that Bible verse. I don't need to look at it. That is pride. That is pride. That is pride. That is evil. I'm going to tell you, we were going through a discipleship uh, sort of program uh, about an hour or so ago, I looked through the passage of Genesis one twenty seven, or excuse me, two. Uh, or, you know, four. God was walking among, or the man was walking among the trees. I've read that passage in the scripture in Genesis four, oodles of times, but it hit me. Instead of walking with God, he was walking among the trees, among the masses, and he was lost in the crowd. It was a nugget of the scripture that I never saw before unless I did what Romans ten seventeen says. By, uh, that, that by faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of God or the message of Christ. It is important to open your Bible and look and follow it is very important because it isn't for as much as it is an act of faith to believe that Jesus is Lord and Master over your life and by His blood you're saved and by His stripes you're healed and that He's given you His Holy Spirit, etc., etc. It, it is the same level of faith to believe and open the Bible and say, yes, this, this is God's Word. 
I don't know the verse enough. Please take that to heart. It's very important. I, I'm speaking for personal testimony. Very important. Psalm 27, verse 1. I'll even to you Hebrew buffs. It says, Yahweh ori ve'yeshuati mimi ifchad. Okay, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? Okay. So, um, it started in the garden, Genesis 1, Genesis 1. Let there be light. That means He came into the world. Go to John 1. The, the title of the message is The Lord is My Salvation. The visible, risen Lord is my salvation. Okay, John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him. And apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been. Life was in Him. And that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. When God, in Genesis, breathed life into man, this is what John was referencing. He was saying, that life was in Him, God Almighty. But yet John is saying, the Word was God, and then later on the Word became flesh, in verse 14. And that life... The life that was in him, God breathed into man in Genesis 2, the breath of life. It's his breath. He gave it on loan. And that life was the light of men. The Lord is my light. Proverbs says that the, the spirit of the man is a lamp of the Lord. And he with whom the Lord is angry, it will be put out. Who is this light? Who is this light? Why is it important that this light that we know is Jesus Christ is God in the flesh almighty? Why is that important? Because if he was man, you're doomed to be saved. Go to Titus verse 2. Or chapter 2, sorry. Titus 2 verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared with salvation for all people. I'm going to stop right there. The grace of God has appeared. In John 1, it says that with Moses came the law and grace. When God came to mankind on Mount Sinai to his people Israel and gave them the law, prior to that, they, they didn't have it written down. They were only going by... Uh, oral communication, whatever was passed down. It was, you know, the, the Jews today believe that Torah, it was a grace that we had Torah. Why? So that we would know what to do. But they miss it. They miss it. it it's like one vessel. You have, um, it's almost as if you could say you have a five gallon, uh, that the law was considered a, you know, a cup. But yet, Jesus comes into the scene. John 1 says, when Jesus came, he has given us, listen, grace upon grace. Why? Because 
um, the grace of God appears. What was that grace? God dwelling in man. God made flesh. He had an earthly garment. That was gracious. More grace. Grace upon grace. I love David Brainerd. If, if you could ever pick up a copy of the Diary and Journal of David Brainerd, uh, it, it is well worth the read because you will see God's faithfulness. And David Brainerd in his journal section talks about revival among the indigenous people, the Delaware indigenous people, uh, Susquehanna River, uh, Cross Wecom, um, and he's been exposed to cold and uh, uh, the elements and just, you know, uh, suffered tuberculosis all his life till he died at the age of 29. Um, and yet his book is still read today. Um, and he was, a, he was a country pastor, he was an itinerant pastor. Now, is this going to fly in the face of, of, of some people? You want to know what he preached? The love and mercy and glory and beauty of Jesus Christ. And the indigenous people res responded like this. Oh, have mercy on me. They, were con they felt condemned. People, one woman who didn't even, who believed she didn't even have a soul mocked David Brainerd when she asked him what he was doing. She went with him anyway to the meeting. She immediately got convicted of her soul and then started weeping for hours. The, the people there couldn't hold her up. All she could say in her native language was, have mercy on me a sinner. Have mercy on me a sinner. Have, uh, for hours. They couldn't pick her up off the ground. She was in the dust. Have mercy on me a sinner. David Brainerd said word none about their sin. None. <laughs> he said, that's a grace of God instructs us to deny godlessness and worldly lust. If you get a picture of the risen Jesus in front of you, I'm speaking metaphorically, and, and if you would go to the Gospels and see that the God of the universe has come in flesh, He is God Almighty. It says here, verse 13, while we, uh, let me read 12, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, that the grace of God instructs us to deny godliness, worldly lust, and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age. While we wait for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, if He's not God, throw this whole book out. It has to be such. He is the Savior. You have no other. We saw the grace of God come down as a baby, crucified, treated as a common criminal, risen from the dead, 50 days later appearing to many disciples, pouring out His very essence upon us. The second time, the first time was in creation, the second time in redemption. And miracles, signs and wonders proceeded. Never ended, folks. It's still here. It still happens. Lives have changed. And yet, we act as if we don't believe it to be true. He's good. Go to Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. Go to verse 3. This is so important. This is so important. Get, ask the Lord to write. I tell people, if you want to know more Bible, you want to know more Scripture, you want to know His Word, you love His Word, you love it, say, Jesus, I can't memorize this. I can't do this. Write your Word in my heart. Oh, He'll do it. He took your heart of stone. He gave your heart of flesh. He gave you His Spirit. He'll write His Word upon your heart and you'll never forget it. 
Even if you lose your mind, your mental faculties, it'll never go away. Never forget Leanne's grandmother who uh, was struggling in the end of her life with um, Alzheimer's. And, I'll, uh, and, and she, she seemed like a child uh, not remembering certain things. And I remember sitting at a restaurant with her. She was still able to move around and, and you know, feed herself. Uh, I started chit-chatting with her on spiritual things. Boom! She immediately, yeah, because it's the flash. And I mean, boom, Christ crucified and just right there. Said, Jesus! Because the spiritual things are not fleshly things. They're not earthly things. They're spiritual. It's of a different nature. It's, it's, the, it's akin to a balloon not being able to be held because it's filled with helium. Because it's on a law of buoyancy. But here, it's gravity. It, gravity can't hold it. The spirit can't be ident- identified. We could talk about it, how the spirit functions. Spirit quickens us, gives us His Word. Oh God, I don't know what to do. Boom, you know immediately right there. Isaiah 43, 3. For I, Yahweh, your God, the Holy One of Israel, and your... What's that word? Savior. Savior. Give Egypt as a ransom for you, Cush and Sheva in your place. Now... The Lord is having me read this. Somebody out there is listening. Y'all need to know. Blessed. There's, 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 there's a girl right now listening. A young lady. Sister, this, this word is for you. Because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. Sister, you're feeling down. God is speaking right now. He loves you. Don't commit suicide. He loves you. He's calling out to you. Please come back home to Jesus. Go to uh, verse 11. Same, same chapter. I, I love it in the Hebrew. Anochi, Anochi, Yahweh, Meshichecha. I, I am ya- Whenever in the scripture it's repeated, God is saying, listen up. I, I am Yahweh and there is no other Savior but me. I alone declared, saved and proclaimed and not some foreign God among you so you are my witnesses. This is the Lord's declaration and I am God. Also from today on, I am He alone. None can deliver from my hand. I act and who can reverse it? If Jesus is, in the scripture it says, God our Savior. If he, if he is not God in flesh, then that New Testament, you got to get rid of it. Because all throughout the New Testament, it says Jesus is Savior. There's only one Savior. God says it here. I am Yahweh. You have no other Savior but me. It breaks Torah, folks. Check the Ten Commandments. I am Yahweh, your God. You'll have no other gods before me. Jesus is God or He's not. If He's not, you need to, you need to do something else. But if he is, you're responsible. He's your Lord. He's your master. Because it's Yahweh here. What does Yeshua mean? Yahweh saves. You will name him Yeshua because he will save his people. You will name him Yahweh saves because he will save his people. Matthew. Go to Hosea. Um, 13.4. Hosea, after Daniel, uh, I'm not insulting anybody's intelligence, there's some new believers, um, it's, it's right after Daniel, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Hosea. Isaiah chapter 13. Verse 4. I have been Yahweh your God ever since the land of Egypt. You know no God but me and no Savior exists besides me. He will be your God today. He will be your God tomorrow. He will be your God forevermore. He was your God yesterday. He's your Savior yesterday, today and tomorrow. He's a living Savior. He doesn't just save you 
uh, when you first gave your life to Christ, He saves you today, He saves you tomorrow, He saves you when you can't find your keys, He saves you when your family's sick, He saves you when you don't know what to do for job, career, He saves you when you can't uh, reconcile with a brother, sister, wife, He saves you when you're, you're, you have a scab that just won't heal, He saves you when you're frustrated that you can't get out the door on time. Those are, that's all salvation. He's in the big things and the little things. If he counts the hairs on your head, you better believe he's involved. This one got me. Psalm 118, verse 21. And this is the crux of the matter. How God becomes Psalm 118, verse 21. I will give thanks to you because you have answered me and have become my salvation. I, I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible, HCSB. Now, the Hebrew says this. Enitani li li Yeshua. Now, that preposition Lee. You have become to me my salvation. You, you will be to me. It is a prophecy. This is probably the most prophetic song in the scripture. You will be physically manifested my salvation. Physically manifest. They were, this book, the Old Testament, were hints saying, I promise you I am going to come and save you from the ultimate bondage you had back in the garden. Here are a little hint. I saved Jacob. I saved Abraham. I saved David. I saved Abigail. When she fell on her face and said, It's my fault. The guilt is on me. That's First Samuel, uh, I believe, 25. Uh, the guilt is on me. Please, blame me. Don't listen to my husband. He's rightly named Fool. Nabal or Nabal. And David said, blessed are you that, have, uh, that I was going to do something stupid in my anger. And then he takes her his wife and she says, and I love the picture of the humility. This one's free. She says, let me be your, the servant of your servants. Jesus was that way. Put the blame on me. The God of the universe said, put the blame on me. When you see the love, how many, we have children, they, they, say, they say, Daddy, I messed this up. Don't worry, honey. I got this. <sighs> Romans 9.5 says that he is God blessed over all. Amen. He's talking about Jesus. Romans 9.5 The ancestors are theirs. He's talking about Israel's rejection of Christ. And from them, by physical descent, came the Messiah, who is God over all, praised forever. Amen. Folks, Jesus is God. He created you. He formed you. I love the, 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 the Isaiah passage where he says, Behold, I have engraven you in the palms of my hands. If you could close your eyes and picture a person naked. He didn't have a loincloth there, folks. He was naked. He was not ashamed. He took our shame. We deserve to be there. And those nails in his hands, your name was on it. Your name was on those nails. Your name was on those nails. And he said, I love you. I love you. I have a plan for you. You're qualified now. After he rose from the dead, he doesn't stop there. And uh, 
God says, I have a mission for you. I want you to bring others. Bring others. He paid the price. There's a challenge. Are you ready for SEAL training? Are you ready for SEAL training? So, um, this is where Leanne's going to... Some people pass the baton, I pass the baby. <laughs> um, so head to Revelation, and I'm going to try to be quick. And everybody's laughing inside, that's okay. Um, I sort of started this um, study back a while ago with the kids as we were uh, beginning to study Revelation. I have a confession to make. I don't like Revelation, or rather, I didn't like Revelation until this past go-around um, because it terrified me. And um, most people come to Revelation and they look at it as the great roadmap of the end of mankind. And so um, people who this excites look at it with great desire to know the mysteries of God this is like a prophetic book that's still living, and I can look in here and find out what's going to happen to the end, you know, in the end, and human race, and and sin, and death, and Satan, and the Babylon, whoever that is, and and the prostitute. I mean, it's got great stuff in there, and so um, people look at it either with awe and wonder and excitement, or with terror, and I fit in the second camp. And so I didn't like looking at it very much, but I knew that God said there was a blessing for reading it, and so I faithfully read it every year as I went through uh, out of duty. And this year, the Lord really opened up this book, and I have come to love it. Um, I had to repent a little bit because I was looking at the book, and I don't know if this resonates with anybody, as almost a fortune teller's manual. And I don't know if that resonates with anybody right now or not, but that's just divination with a Christian gloss. When you're trying to see what's going to happen in the future and figure it out, who is, is it, is that the Catholic Church that's sitting on the Ten Hills or is it the Muslim nations coming against us or, you know, is Russia that kingdom from the north? And we start trying to look at our current events and match them up with what God says in his word. And we begin to make plans based off of that. And and then we, we get, if we really go down this road, we get really dogmatic about it. You know, I know this is. And, uh, and then if you're in a fringe group, you start setting dates. Jesus is coming back, the fill in the blank. And some people have really had egg on their face a couple of times over the years because they've studied and they've learned and they've seen patterns and types in the scripture and they're really there. And they've applied them and they forgot that Jesus said there's nobody who knows the day or the hour. You know the season. So I just caution you because if you're like me, there was a tendency to sort of want to look into there and find out what's going to happen because I think deep down inside we all want to feel secure. We want to feel like we know and that sense of, sense of power. Like I know what's going on in this situation. And when the world looks particularly crazy, we really want to know. And we're in a, a state of chaos in many ways right now societally, in the social world, people are doing really odd things. And so people are reaching out for some sort of knowledge about what's going to happen to them or how it's going to happen. But I'm going to present a different way of looking at Revelation, not based off of historical things of what happened in the past, current day events, um, or what might be happening in the future. I'm not saying that this wouldn't necessarily physically manifest. Okay, don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that it won't. I'm saying I don't know. And I trust that God does know. And we'll probably look back on it and go, Oh, so that's how it worked. Sort of like the Jews and those who have 
become believers thereafter look back at the prophets and go, oh, that's how it worked. He was coming as a baby. You know, the entire nation missed it except for a few shepherds. But they were looking in those prophecies and they were looking forward and they had it all figured out in their mind what was going to happen. Like people are today, looking forward to Christ's second coming and they got it figured out in their dogma how it's going to happen, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, I don't know, trib, I don't know. Uh, so just just be careful. But for everybody, no matter where you fall on the eschatological line, there is a message spiritually for us. Because the Bible is physical, with real physical rules, and it's also spiritual, and it, it does use types and patterns and, and metaphors and pictures for us to explain spiritual truths, because we are physical people, and we're bound by physical you know, eyes and ears and nose and mouth to, in order to perceive the world. And so God has to put it in a language that we can understand. But he's talking about spirit things that would be you know, spiritually discerned. So I'm, I'm encouraging you to look at this perhaps in a little different way. And the very first thing I want to say is that this is not a revelation of the end of the world, which is the way I looked at it. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It is a picture of who he is and his multifaceted uh, being. And so when we finish reading Revelation, which we're not going to do all today, but when you finish reading Revelation, you should walk away with a better picture of who Jesus is and how he interacts in our life as the lion and the lamb, as the exalted one, the great I am. And I didn't mean to rhyme. All right. So I wanted to start. Actually, we're not starting at the beginning at all. Um, Revelation. Revelation 4, the end of 4. And um, if you're ever going through Revelation, I'll just give you this little thing that the Lord showed me, is that whenever he's getting ready to do a series, and, and Revelation has all these series, it's like a series of seven letters, and there's seven uh, seals and there's seven trumpets and then he does a series of threes okay and every time he does these series he has like a little preface and that preface usually is some sort of song or hymn or revelation of God in his heavenly throne room and you see sort of a glimpse into the heavens and that what he reveals there about his character and his nature and what is said about him is the light in which you interpret the next section. Okay? So the two are connected. So we're going to actually start, even though we're going to talk about the scroll, we're going to look at this last little hymn. Um, these are the ones who have just surrendered their crowns before the throne, the elders there. Um, the 24 elders, and they throw down their crowns and they sing a little hymn. And this is the hymn they sing. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your plan they were created and exist. So that's a little preface to the next section, which we're, we're going to focus on. And the things to point out about that is, one, God has identified it as the creator God. And two... He has a plan, and that plan was created by him, and he sustains the things according to his plan. They exist, they continue to go on, and everything is going as planned. This is a very comforting thought for anybody like me who was scared to death of Revelation. Because there's a plan, and it's not chaos, although it appears to us as you read it like it's chaotic. You know, mountains falling and islands fleeing and things being burned up and fire and hail mixed with blood and all this stuff. Okay, that seems pretty chaotic. But there was a plan. And the plan is going as planned. It's being executed by the one who wrote the plan. Okay? So keep that in mind. So chapter 5, verse 1, he says, um, I saw the one seated on the throne and he was holding in his right hand an unopened scroll was writing on the inside and the outside. And it was sealed with seven seals. And then I saw an incredibly powerful angel, this is John, who's recording all this, proclaiming with a great loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seven seals? So the, the question is, what is the scroll? 
it's a very important thing. It apparently has to be unrolled bit by bit. Mm -hmm. And whatever's written inside is not privy to everybody. Only to somebody who is worthy to break the seals. I would suggest to you that in light of the previous section, it is the plan. It's the plan of eternity for us that he's going to unroll bit by bit by bit. I think it's the plan for humanity with a capital H like everybody. And it's also a plan that is individualized for us because God always deals with us in two ways at the same time. He's God. He can do that. He deals with us as a body, Israel, the congregation, and he deals with us individually in our own hearts with a unique relationship. So there's two different ways he deals with us at the same time. When the scroll is being sealed, it's not enacted. It's like, you know, it's a covenant that hasn't been put into effect. And this is a terrifying thing for John. John says, no person could be found, living or dead in all of creation. No one was worthy to open the scroll and read its contents. And this was a terrifying thing to John. He breaks down and weeps with intense sorrow because nobody was found to open the scroll. And an angel comes over to him, or sorry, an elder comes over to him and says, Stop weeping. Look, behold, the mighty lion of Judah's tribe, the root of David, he has conquered. He is worthy, the one who can open the scroll and its seven seals. So John does what he did by the elder. He turns and he looks for the lion of Judah, the root of the branch of David. But you know what he sees? I saw a young lamb standing in the middle of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the 24 elders. You know, this is such a truth. Um, as I re-looked at this passage again, what we expect to see, the elder says, the Lion of Judah. We look at it and we go, oh, it's a lamb. <laughs> Who was wrong? That's Neither. A slaughtered lamb. Yeah, you don't get more humble than that. Slaughtered lamb. You, you know, what we perceive on earth is very different what God perceives in heaven. So our circumstances that we consider perhaps bad or unfortunate or whatever are not the way God sees it from heaven. It may be his working salvation out in your life. It's a blessing from his perspective to you because he's stripping everything that's not of him out of your life. But you look at it and go, what tragedy! I've lost! I'm fallen! I'm humbled to the dust! And he goes, yes, so I can come in and fill you up with my strength so that you can know me more in this particular aspect of your life. We don't always see the way God sees. This lamb, though, is not without strength. He has seven horns, and the horn is always strength. And he has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, the sevenfold spirits of God sent to the ends of the earth. It is the spirit of Christ which lives within us. And in a complete measure, the spirit goes out among the earth, just like it was out when it was brooding over the waters in creation. It's the same kind of picture. If you ever want to do an interesting study, look at Genesis and parallel it with Revelation. They're bookends. One starts and one finishes, and all of it is held together by Jesus. It is in a beautiful, beautiful thing. So he sees the Lamb. He takes the throne from the Father, who's seated uh, there in heaven, and he takes it from the right hand, the hand of power from the Lord. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures, they see the Lamb who had taken the scroll, and they begin immediately to worship him. And each of those elders, um, they had a harp and a golden bowl, 
and it's brimming full of sweet, fragrant incense. If you read Revelation, you will find that there's lots of bowls all the way throughout, and they're usually filled with incense, and different descriptors are given to those bowls. This particular set of bowls had sweet-smelling incense, like the incense that the priests would carry in, okay? And these are the prayers of the Lord's saints, and that's what they have there before the Lord. And they're going to sing a song, this new song, in praise to the Lamb. Because you were slaughtered for us, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. Your blood was the price paid to redeem us, and you purchased us to bring us to God out of every tribe, language, people, group, and nation. You have chosen us to serve our God and formed us into a kingdom of priests to reign on the earth. And so this gives us the purpose. This little hymn is what sets up the seals. Okay? So that's why I'm sort of going through it right now. These... 24 elders, so you have 12, and you have another 12, and I believe that they stand for the, the 12 tribes of Israel, the, the, those who were expectant of Messiah coming, and those who were the apostles on the other side of Christ and his death and resurrection who stand as witness to the sacrifice of Messiah, and both of them have faith. That's what joins them together. And both of them are giving honor. You know, one was looking forward, the other is now looking back. just depends on which side of the cross you're on. But it all goes back to the lifting up of the Lord. So here they are. They're all singing the same song. And they tell us what the purpose of God was. The purpose of that opening of the scroll was so that we could be joined to God. You purchased us to bring us to God. Why? So that we could be chosen to serve our Lord or our God and formed into a kingdom of priests who reign. So the idea of, you know, Peter, he talks about as a kingdom of priests, a royal priesthood, those who are not just priests who offer sacrifices to God, but also those who are ruling and reigning. This idea. Okay? That was the point of what's coming next. You see, it takes a certain kind of breed of person. I was reading this morning uh, in Matthew 23. I'll flip over there real quick. Jesus is heading to the cross, and he's got run-ins with the Pharisees. He's always got run-ins with the Pharisees. And he tells a parable to them. Hang on, it's not 23. Just kidding. uh, 22, the parable of the wedding feast. So he's, he's teaching this parable about the kingdom of heaven. And he, he tells us, or I'll just sort of paraphrase it. He says, there was a king and he prepares a feast and he, once it's all ready to go, he goes and sends out his servants, all the people who were invited. They already were invited. These were the guys who, you know, it's been on the calendar for a couple months already. And so he sends out his uh, his servants to say, okay, it's time. Come to the feast. And he's all excited. It's a, it's a feast for the son who's getting married. And um, it says uh, in verse 3, the way that this translation puts it, they chose not to come. So the king sends out even more servants to inform the invited guests, saying, come, for the sumptuous feast is now ready. He's he's offering communion. He's offering communion with these people. It's, It's the same way I stand at the door and knock, and anybody who opens the door, I will come in to him and sup with him. Okay, that's what he's offering to these people. They were invited. They had a right to be there. Ah, I don't think I want to go. Some of them make excuses. Uh, I've got business to do, one says in five. Another wanted to work on his farming enterprise. In other words, the things of this earth. The stuff I have to do here. I've got, I've got responsibilities, you know. Family to look after. Good stuff to do. 
I, I just don't have time to come to the feast. Otherwise, they um, seized the king's messengers and shamefully mistreated them and even killed them. And so the king brings judgment to them, destroys their cities, burns them up, and executes the murderers. But here they lash out against, you know, how dare you bother me? I'll just get rid of the problem. If you guys listened to last week, it's Cain. It, this is Cain all over again. I'll just, you know, make the annoyance go away by killing it. The king said to his servants, go out. I will have my feast full. And so go into the streets. Anybody who is there, invite them. Anyone. And so they went and invited the good and the bad, and they brought them in. And the king gave them, of course, they didn't have time to prepare for the feast. And probably in the slums and the alleyways, they didn't have much money to uh, spend on proper attire to the king's feast. And so he gives them garments in which to wear that were not their own, but he, he supplies for them what they need. He's walking around in that feast, and he sees a guy who doesn't have uh, the wedding robe that had been provided for him. And so he says, my friend, verse 12, how is it that you're here and you're not wearing your wedding garment? And the man had nothing to say. He was speechless. The king turned to his servant and he said, tie him up. Throw him into the outer darkness where there will be great sorrow with weeping and grinding of teeth for everyone is invited to enter in. But few are called. Or, in the Aramaic, it's translated interestingly, few respond in excellence. Now, I think this is a particularly interesting parable as we begin to look at the seals because there is a response to the revelation of God being high and mighty and His Son being lifted up, worthy to take the scroll and to begin to open the seals, the one who is worthy to be slain, the one who is worthy of all honor and, and power, praise and glory and dominion to Christ the Lamb forever and ever. In Revelation it says, Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive great power and might and wealth and wisdom and honor and glory and praise. There's a response to that. There should be a response in our hearts of submission and willingness to lay down ourself and say, it's all you. You can have all of me. I don't have anything to bring, but you can have all of me. And, and that surrender is just appropriate. It's, it's just a reasonable service. I mean, that's what Paul says, right? Present yourselves as a living sacrifice. Please get acceptable to God. That's your reasonable duty. That's just the bare minimum, guys. And when you do that, you are answering an invitation. You're answering a call. And the answer of the call begins the opening of the scrolls in your personal life. And it is the story of redemption in your life and becoming holy gods. That's the purpose. That you will become 100% the Lord. Because uh, we were just watching um, Victory Over Darkness, a DVD series by Neil Anderson. And he made the comment in there. He said, when you get saved, you are positionally seated in the heavenly places with God. And it happens then, right then. You have died with Christ. You've been buried with Christ. You were raised with Christ. You have His life. You have His garments. His righteousness now wraps you just like those people in that wedding feast. You're wrapped in the righteousness of Christ and you are seated in the heavenly places positionally. It is all a, a fact. It's truth. Right then. But we still sin. How does that work out? And he makes the comment, he says, well, you've spent however many years being conditioned according to the world system, according to the world's ways. And so God has to go in and sanctify you, that's the theological term we use, but deprogram you. 
from the world and its ways and all of its lies, the lies from the devil and from every system that is in this world that is based off of performance and not based off of the truth of God. And so that process takes a while. That is the seal process. When you say, okay, Lord, I choose to believe you, and you just do whatever you got to do to get the flesh out of me. And you present yourself on that altar before the Lord. He says, okay, I'll do it. And I'm going to bring you to God so that you will be a priest. And at the end of this process, you're going to be a priest and a king, and you're going to be reigning with me in like visible, manifest way. You're doing it positionally now, but where people will look at you and go, you're like, Jesus, I see you. I see God in you. Whoa, that person, they have the touch of the divine in their life. Your light will shine forth. It won't be yours. It'll be the Holy Spirit shining forth. It'll be the Holy Spirit shining forth through your faith. That is the process that we're going to talk about, and I'm not going to go any further. But uh, that's, that's going to be the unfolding of the seals in your life if you're willing to submit to it. Look, it is not an easy road. It is a good road. But the flesh will fight you the entire way. So you must walk humbly before your God. You must walk humbly and love that justice and say, okay, Lord, I submit. I'm going to agree with you. And when you point something out wrong in my life, I'm going to agree with you. I'm not going to fight you on it. And I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn around as soon as you show me. And if you, there's a mountain in my life, remove it. Mm. Just, just, just take it out. Because you said, you said that if I had the faith of a mustard seed, mm. that I could tell that mountain to get up and throw itself into the sea. So I just ask you, Lord, right now, to remove the mountains out of our hearts so that our soil would be fertile for your true word. And Lord, weeds, they grow up in our lives. Every season, the weeds come up. Lord, I just pray that you would pluck out those weeds, those cares of the world. Anything that is deceitful, and it's taken root in our soil. Anything that we're trusting in that's not you, anything that's distracting us from you, that's keeping us from worshiping you, from beholding your face, from giving you praise and honor and glory, any wrong thinking, any lie that we've believed, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, I pray right now you would convict people and that you would tell them the lies they're hearing that are not of you. Father, I just pray you would do your refining work in us because I know you yearn jealously for our souls. There isn't anything you want more than unhindered communication with us. That's why you came and you died. It was so that you could, you could fully embrace us and we could embrace you and find our satisfaction and our security in you. We could understand the deep, deep love of Jesus for us. The love that accepts us no matter what regardless of how many times we fail, who looks at us and says, you are my beloved son whom I am well pleased in because Christ is within you and if he says it to Christ, he says it to you. He says it to you. And it doesn't matter how many times you make a mistake because your relationship with him is not dependent on you, it's dependent on him and he is faithful even when we're faithless. He is faithful. So submit yourselves, I beg you, to the process of giving yourself completely to the Lord and letting Him do His work. Let Him do His surgery in you so that you can be wholly His and you can do every good work that He has promised and He has prepared for you since before the foundations of the earth. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that you love us more than we can imagine. Lord, may we know your love. May we see you for who you truly are. Lord, I pray right now that anybody has a wrong thought about who you are because of their earthly father's image. Lord, I pray that you would show them, even this week, right now, if, that who you truly are, that the lies would be shattered and that they would by faith accept who you are as 
their Father God, a good Father who loves and will not reject, who is always present, who will not leave us as orphans, who is is concerned about us, interested in us. You created every hair on our head and you know every problem that we're going through and your heart breaks with us when we are hurting. Father, you allow us to fail. You allow us to, to stumble, but you don't shame us. You don't guilt us. You pick us up and you give us strength and encouragement and you forgive us when we go wrong. Lord, may fix our minds to receive the truth about you not the lies we hear from the world, from Mm -hmm. Satan, from our past experiences with our own human fathers who had their own set of struggles. Mm -hmm. Father, please heal us. We are broken people. I thank you for your mercy and your love. In Yeshua's name we pray and we lift you up high, high because you are worthy. You are so worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the altar call for today, if you have not allowed the Lord to have every room in your heart where you've not allowed his light to come in, he spoke, he said he is the light. His life was the light of men. If you've believed anything wrong, and you say, you know, something, there's that one thing, all these years, I believed it, and it's not right, it's wrong. Come to the altar, lay it down. You don't have to carry that bag anymore. You were never meant to. That was supposed to be laid at the cross. Don't believe the lies anymore. Come to the altar, confess that you've agreed with the lies. Lies that were spoken about you, spoken to you, lies that you've believed, false doctrines, false theologies, false words about yourself from parents, loved ones, enemies, well-meaning, moments of weaknesses, areas where you did not allow Jesus to shine. Come to the altar. And then if, if you have a... a uh, If you're sick and you need prayer, also we'll pray for you.